I thought I was running a workshop, and now I'm a major speaker. God knows how. <laughs> anyway, I'll do my best. Um, I come from a little movement, apart from C&D and things, but also movement for the abolition of war, which started about the year 2000, when Joseph Rotblatt, who, like, rather like your Wilberforce, said that uh, the need now is not just to talk about individual weapons, but to challenge war itself, to start abolishing war. Whether you're a pacifist or not a pacifist, he didn't care. And he was the man, if you remember, who refused, he was the only scientist who refused to work on the bomb in 1944. The only one, a lot of them bleated about it, but only one man gave up his job and said that he wouldn't continue. And he was called a communist and all that stuff. Anyway, so that's movement of abolition of war, and we've been campaigning on all sorts of things like education in schools, getting people to know what the UN Charter says, telling people about the arms trade, and all these things, they all overlap, but all working on nuclear weapons, conscientious objection. We're very now engaged on the First World War, presenting a slightly alternative from Max Hastings' view of the First World War, etc., etc. So we're quite busy. And we're under, we don't have a staff, we're very simple. But one thing that came up uh, during, the, during the last five years was we ought to do something about conflict and climate change. Well, I knew nothing about conflict and climate change, whatever, and I don't think many of our members did, but we got down to it, and by dint of badgering people for money, you're good at that, but we raised something like 25,000 pounds, that's what it cost, actually, at the end, to produce a DVD and a teaching pack in the front of it, uh, which is precisely on conflict and climate. It lasts about 16 minutes. And it's, it's extre it had very well good reviews, especially in Peace News. It's ideal for schools. It starts discussion groups, and so on and so on. And we have all these prestigious people in it, Salomon Hook, Caroline Lucas, Bay Robinson, Paul Rogers, Vandanda Shiva, and others, and including a lot of young people who don't get on the front, but people from Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, uh, and other <laughs> younger organizations speaking as well. So it's partly talking heads, but young heads. It's also filmed on scene in Bangladesh, in the Sudan, in all sorts of places like that. And, and just to summarize what I take from that thing, it's perfectly clear now to me that if conflict change is coming, and it certainly is coming, and this country can argue, argue any longer uh, that it's around, it will mean dramatic changes for many people in their lives. If we get uncertain weather, uh, then we're going to get uncertain crops, and we're going to get shortage of food. And shortage of food means that other people want food that you've got, and uh, they're going to try and take it from you. As somebody said in this, the Egyptian riots didn't start over political rights, they started over bread prices. And that's true of much of the Mediterranean upheavals that we've done. But that's how it began, moved on elsewhere. We know that the rising seas are going to mean refugees. I don't know how the, what the figure is, but Bangladesh is something like a meter and a half or two meters in average above sea level. And if the seas rise, and come, there could be millions of people on the move. And where are they all going to go to? Well, not here. Not if our government's got anything to do with it. Um, uh, they'll be kept out. But they'll want to go somewhere, and there will be conflict. And we know there are now fences being put up, Mexico, the United States, um, India and, uh, and Pakistan, all kinds of fences we could prevent migration from one place to another. They'll want to go. Uh, when, when the deserts appear, and that's what we're seeing in the Sudan, the first of the Sudan conflict was not about some Muslim Christian affair. It was because the, the desert was encroaching, the grazing lands were not available, and so people moved into other areas and conflict developed. I think that's really enough for me. I'm absolutely not an expert. I'm a complete fraud. And I've, <laughs> I've, I've talked nonsense for some time in the past, and I'm not frightened to do it again. I, you can get away with it as long as you sound confident. Um, and I'm quite confident. So um, anyway, I'm a bit of an apostle for conflict and climate change. And there are many other areas of climate change that are relevant to what we're talking about, but conflict and wars coming out of climate change are already there. Uh, most of the wars today are not wars between major states. They're civil wars or community wars um, because um, environmental consequences produce these things. All right for me? Can I clap myself? Thank you very much. <laughs> We can imagine the end of the planet, but we can't imagine the end of capitalism. And that, I think, is really interesting. Um, uh, you know, why is that? And the reason is because, um, and partly my side, my side is to blame for this, that we've got so culturally wrapped up in, uh, in materialism 
um, in consumerism, uh, in, in, in describing ourselves and understanding ourselves uh, and our relationships with each other through what we buy. Um, and this is, has a deep and abiding hold on us. Um, now, what does that mean to someone from the Labour Party? Well, firstly, the um, climate change you know, and the implication of buying more stuff. You know, buying stuff we didn't know we wanted with money we don't have to, you know, to, to impress people we don't yet know. I mean, that's, you know, that's the lunacy of, of the system. Um, and we're only just at the, the, you know, the tip of the iceberg of this. You know, when they start putting algorithms into databases and, and, and when you, you know, before you get to the computer, they'll know what you're thinking, they'll know what you want. They'll, you know, they, they're just literally at the forefront of the, of the, of the consumer revolution. Um, you know, just go and watch the film like The Matrix. That tells you everything you need to know about the future of what our existence is going to be. So, okay, so, the, so briefly, the Labour Party, um, climate change hits, because for the reasons that Bruce has said, hits the poor hardest. It's, it's their floods, it's their conflict, which, you know, so I care about poor people, so I now care about climate change. But as much as that, this kind of mad turbo consumer, endless race, the endless, exhausting, perpetual, never ending, because more and more want to produce race, just stretches any sense of social solidarity because we're all judging each other and ourselves on the bloody rubbish that you know the shirts we don't wear and the books we don't read and the music we don't listen to and the you know and the, the holidays we have and you know so that's just kind of making it impossible to have any common sense of of existence of common places of common belief uh, 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 of, of, of social bonds so I asked the question of myself and my party, and Michael's here, and maybe other people from the Labour Party, when is enough enough for the worker, right? Now, clearly, we don't want people in food banks. Clearly, we want some level of material existence. But how big does the worker's plasma screen have to be before we're satisfied? That's the question. And, and, and I, so, so my interest is, how do we make uh, a good society, one in which we are more equal, uh, uh, one that, which is democratic and sustainable, how do we make that mo both desirable and feasible? Because at the moment, us in the room who want this different world are the chumps because we haven't produced, we haven't placed, we haven't identified, uh, uh, we, ha you know, we haven't constructed a future which is more desirable or more feasible than the world in which you know, we can imagine the end of uh, the, the planet but not the end of capitalism. So how do we talk and how do we behave of a good society in which love, time, compassion, cooperation trumps stuff which is just junk, which is presented to us? If we can't do that, then there's something wrong with us, it seems to me. And the insight that keeps me going, really, is, is, is the one that says um, that when you die, you don't actually die wishing you had a bigger plasma television screen. You die wishing you had more, more time with the people that you love and doing the things that you love. And can we use that insight now to direct us and propel us to do something to stop this echo side? So we did have a big presentation here this evening. We were going to tell you the sort of problems that Greenpeace had looked at around the world, uh, rainforest depletion, land degradation, and what Greenpeace did and has done for those sorts of things. The climate change... I'm so pleased. There are two things that have happened in the last week. One of them is that hell has frozen over. Somewhere in America, there's a town called hell, and it's frozen <laughs> over. So if things can change that much, the other big change is that the CC word is now politically OK to say. Before the floods, before the snows in America, no decent parliamentarian worth his salt would ever utter the words climate change. And now, they're all at it. We've heard, just a few weeks ago, did we not hear that David Cameron, sorry, I'm going off topic here. David Cameron said something about, he didn't want to know anything more about that green CRAP, and yet he's now repositioning himself as a, a, a climate helper. So back to Greenpeace, sorry. As you know, I'm sure, it started a long time ago. It identified nuclear as one thing. There was a massive report in 2001 about all the forests. There was a big campaign called Save and Delete. Rainforests are very important. Uh, they key the land in. The degradation of the land, once a rainforest has been cut down and burned, 
Uh, it's either so uh, used for cattle. In South America, it's used for corn. Uh, there are also in, in Indonesia the rising problem of palm oil. Uh, Greenpeace has consistently taken actions about all these things. We have achieved change, certainly in the rainforests in Indonesia. There is a now a new directive. Uh, the companies there that we took action against, one of our direct actions was on Blackfriars Bridge outside Unilever, where we dressed up as orangutans to embarrass the company making uh, products from palm oil. If you don't know about palm oil, it's in virtually everything you have. It's in your food, it's in your shampoo. Um, it's one of those generic things that can be moved around. So therefore, it's very profitable. But of course, once you've destroyed an area of old growth forest, and remember, rainforests grow differently. You can't just plant a few trees, but they grow in layers. So you have different ecosystems on each layer and that layer, all those different layers work together. Once you've cut that down, you haven't got the same rainfall management. You haven't got the same earth erosion patterns. Um, so getting rid of a rainforest is changing the climate, not just for its own area, but for other areas that are affected. So Greenpeace has done a lot on that. Um, in the oceans, obviously, we've tried to protect the oceans. Uh, the marine life that's there, there is now the global warming has brought uh, rising temperatures in the oceans, um, that has led to acidification, and that's a bit of a problem because that means that corals uh, are dying. It also means that some sea creatures, like shells, who need um, calcium in their growth patterns are not getting that same amount of calcium. So they're not growing in the same way that they normally did. Um, I'm just trying to think finally. Um, the other thing that we have done a lot of campaigning about is toxins. And we have at the moment running a detox campaign. It started a few years ago where we asked computer uh, makers to look more deeply at their uh, computers, the, the components, the e-electronic stuff that they were doing, so that they would clean up their act. And we got a lot of response from um, people like Sony and others who joined in the detox campaign and have now agreed that their components will not be made of the same harmful things. We're actually on a process at the moment, and it's one of our running campaigns, um, to get detox out of fashion, because a lot of big um, fashion chains, all their clothes are made in China, uh, the dyes go into the rivers over there, the plastics uh, that they cover some certain garments in um, also go into the rivers, and China is suffering a massive, massive um, environmental disaster simply because they're making lots of things for us to throw away after Christmas. So uh, when you're talking about ecocide and rebalancing, one of Greenpeace's actions has been to highlight the different things that happen around the world that we think seem to be normal. Yes, you go and buy a red T-shirt, but can have devastating effects other, in other places. And of course, Greenpeace, whenever they highlight a campaign, they always offer a solution as well. So we don't just go climb up the Eiffel Tower for fun. Yeah, we might do it for fun, but there is a real reason that we're highlighting a particular problem. And a couple of the basic Greenpeace things are to witness to stand by and witness, to highlight a problem, um, and to <laughs> offer a solution. Because there's no point going around flag-waving and saying, oh, you can't do this, you can't do this, because people get fed up with you. You have to offer solutions. And obviously, we've got different solutions for energy generation, solar, wind, uh, CHP. Uh, we don't need nuclear. Um, there's, there's all sorts of things. But I, I must stop also. I'm sure I've spoken quite long enough. Thank you. Thank you about climate change now as um, an international security threat and people have been saying that it should actually be dealt with by the Foreign Office oh, yeah. as opposed to the um, Environment Minister, which, which I think just goes to, to, to show that everything that you say is, is absolutely right. You know, war, conflict and climate change are, are very much you know, part, part of the same uh, you know, problem. You know, they need to be dealt with holistically. Um, and I wonder if you had any sort of reflections on that or if you'd heard about that. 
Yes, I, I think that's a foreign office reaction to climate change, is that there's going to be insecurity, then we do something in a military, in a military way. And uh, it's a complete disaster, but that's what the... And the military, the MOD, have actually got plans for dealing with climate change, the, uh, the movement of refugees, all that, they've got things in place already. So we're, Paul Rogers, who's on the film, the chap from Bradford University, he speaks very well on that, that, that the military is no solution. It's part of the problem. Um, and, uh, of course, they are part of the problem. So, yes, I'm aware of it. I'm not scientifically knowledgeable about it, but I'm well aware that it's a, it's a wrong road to be taking. Other questions? Income? Um, what, like, how many ecocides are there at the moment? Um, <laughs> well, I don't, do you know, I haven't really counted them up. And also, this comes down to what do you define as an ecocide? Well, I thought it was definable, like according to the law that you... Yes. Yeah. I, so the definition I've proposed is the size, duration or impact test that we use during wartime under the Environmental Modification Convention. A size being 200 kilometres or more duration if it knocks out an ecosystem for a season or more. Because if you knock out an ecosystem for a season, then you're knocking it out for decades, sometimes far longer than that, especially if you're looking at arboreal wetlands or ancient forests. I, and impact is severity of impact to human, natural or, or economic resources. So it doesn't have to have a price tag on it to qualify. But of course, the thing is some, some areas are very easily identifiable as an ecocyte. So the tar sands or um, the Amazon. I, some are not so easy to identify. So, for instance, fracking, when uh, you're looking at a solo fracking unit, but of course it's to look at the cumulative impact. And when you start to look at the cumulative impact, then you're seeing, for instance, what's playing out in Dakota and northern Montana, where I've, I've direct, directly experienced it, is enormous damage and destruction on, on a huge scale, and huge breakdown of, of um, societal infrastructure as well. So the definition of ecocide actually doesn't just cover ecological ecocide, it's also cultural ecocide. And the important thing is it's not a tick box exercise. We don't just have, okay, you've got to have done this, you've got to have done that, done that. Because what happens is often then you find that there are ways around it. The important thing was when the test that was put in place under the Environmental Modification Convention was based on, in truth, the use of Agent White, Blue and Orange during the... We wouldn't be here today. I, so it had to be stopped and it was about going upstream to the source of the problem and saying, okay, what do we define as significant harm? What are the parameters? If we just say it's now illegal to use Agent Orange, someone will just reinvent it under a new name with a slightly different chemical matrix. So this is the important thing, it's about going upstream. And of course that's why we have courts where there's a grey area, then put it to the test in a court of law and see what's decided from there and build up case law around that as well. Because I've thought of this a bit, this question, and I thought that maybe the oil spill in the Gulf of yeah. Mexico and the Fukushima yeah. would probably score yeah. an ecocide. I, I don't know, I think ticking the box isn't a bad thing as such. Because it sort of puts a hole in in the earth, and it helps promote your work. Well, in essence, I don't I don't think what's important here is is actually getting the, the box ticked. It's about recognizing what is significant harm and saying, okay, what are we going to do to make sure that never happens again? And that's what's really important here. I, and moving away from dangerous industrial activity, but also creating a legal duty of care to give assistance. Fukushima, you mentioned, is very interesting because we're looking at two types of ecocide there. It's not just naturally occurring ecocide, but also the corporate ecocide that plays out as a result of what happened in a natural context. So you had ecosystem a disaster, eco disaster, ecological disaster, which started out through naturally occurring. Um, a trauma, and then it had a trigger, a knock-on impact with the nuclear power stations. So you, you have a mixture going on there, but the important thing is as well, when we're looking at both naturally occurring as well as corporate ecocide, 
by creating that legal duty of care, it addresses issues such as climate refugees. So 54 small island states going underwater, you've got a huge amount of naturally occurring ecocide happening with rising sea levels. And at the moment in climate negotiations, nobody's doing anything about it. But with the law of ecocide, because it also creates a legal duty of care, it ensures that, in fact, we have that conversation and all nations come to the table first and foremost. And in fact, there is a mechanism within the UN called the UN Trusteeship Council that can address this. I'm aware that's a longer conversation though. Um, and I, I actually don't want to hold this space because we do have other speakers as well. And there's a lot of interesting stuff to touch on. So more questions about it, so let's keep that till, till later. All right, sorry. But thank you. And speakers, thank you very much. Yeah, much appreciated.